Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is July 20th, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, U.S.-backed Syrian rebels behead a 10-year-old boy by mistake. Meanwhile, the Pentagon-trained rebels pledge their allegiance to ISIS. Then, desperate liberals are now blaming Matt Drudge for the rise of Donald Trump. <laughs> Plus, a Benghazi survivor says there will be mutiny if Hillary Clinton steals the election. You're not giving orders anymore. You're in my world now. We have 36 American lives to save. All that plus another busy day for the InfoWars crew at the RNC. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I want you to picture for a moment what an accident looks like. Is it an auto accident where somebody gets rear-ended or maybe it's a job place accident where you have to wear a hard hat if you go to a construction site. Now, tell me this, how do you accidentally chop off somebody's head? let alone the head of a little boy, and that is what's being reported by CNN. Rebels, boy beheaded in Syria, a mistake. And they say the beheading could affect U.S. support of the rebels. The rebels claim the boy was a prisoner from a pro-regime militia force made up mostly of Palestinians in Syria, and that he was captured from an unofficial refugee camp north of the war-torn Aleppo. The footage then shows one of the men taking a knife to the child's head. The boy appears to be quite young, perhaps around 10, although CNN cannot confirm or verify the boy's age or identity. In a statement posted on their Facebook page, the rebel group involved called the killing an individual mistake and that it would investigate the human rights abuses that were shared on social media sites. So when I heard this, this story, when I read this headline, I was thinking a mistake. Maybe this young man or this little boy, let's call him what he is, uh, lost his head in some type of shrapnel incident. Maybe there's an explosion, and the shrapnel came, and it, and it cut his head off. And I'm not trying to joke here. I'm being, I'm being very serious here. I'm like, how do you accidentally cut off a little boy's head? Uh, from their own admission in this article by CNN, they say he was maybe around 10 years old. They also say that somebody took a knife to the kid's head, uh, sawed his head off. It wasn't like a real smooth, quick and clean axe or sword. You have to put in effort to saw somebody's head off. But according to CNN, it was a mistake. It was an uh, individual error uh, in another quote here. It was just accidental that uh, this uh, rebel group decided to cut off this little boy's head. And to say how much of this is not a mistake, this was a very intentional action and it's been going on for quite some time. It's making the news now because it's a high profile case of a little boy uh, suffering these consequences. But these Syrian rebels, most of whom aren't even Syrian, we've been documenting this for at least the four years that I've been here, have been caught doing numerous uh, war crimes. I'm not saying that they're the only ones, and I'm not saying that Assad's an angel by any stretch of the imagination, but the Syrian rebels, the group that we back, have a long history of doing this, and to show you that, I just have a small sampling of articles here. Let's start with this one. UN designates free Syrian army affiliates of Al-Qaeda. The Libyan Islamic fighting group currently arming, funding, and commanding Brigades of the so-called Free Syrian Army is designated an Al-Qaeda affiliate by the United Nations. Now, do I agree with everything the United Nations does and says? Absolutely not. But even the United Nations can see clear as day that the Free Syrian Army, a.k.a. the Syrian rebels, are nothing more than a Al-Qaeda group, and they act as such. And, and that's not the only one. Let's take a look at this one a few years back. Syrian rebels commander, yes, we're still collaborating with ISIS. Speaking with Lebanon's Daily Star, Basil Idris, commander of an FSA-run rebels brigade, openly discussed the group's joint operations with ISIS in the Al-Nusra Front. We are collaborating with the Islamic State in the Nusra Front by attacking the Syrian army's gathering. Once again, uh, you have these terrorist organizations being funded by the West. Uh, we have uh, long documentation of that. They chop off a little boy's head and they say it was an accident. It was, uh, what's the quote here? An individual error to be investigated why they thought it was necessary to chop off the head of a little boy. Uh, we'll continue here. Pentagon trained rebel group in Syria pledges allegiance to ISIS aligned al-Nusra. Division 30 
also known as the New Syrian Forces, was created by the United States as part of a propaganda campaign to counter the fact virtually all of the mercenaries in Syria have gone over to the Islamic State. But once again, even though these guys are uh, singing songs about Osama bin Laden, how great he is, and all the other war crimes we've documented here, it was a mistake they chopped off this little boy's head. Uh, we'll, we got one more here talking about Senator John McCain, a guy who just loves war, and he wants to criticize you if you don't know who you're talking about. And we have this article from a couple years ago. Angry McCain admits meeting with ISIS scolds Rand Paul for not knowing terrorists. This is a quote from McCain. Has Rand Paul ever been to Syria? Has he ever met with ISIS? Has he ever met with any of these people? No, no, no. McCain said, clearly in reference to his own visit to Syria in 2013, where he was photographed with leaders of the Free Syrian Army, the fighters violently opposed to the Assad regime. Now, let's show this picture of McCain here. Now, in this picture, these are several guys who have done the war atrocities that we've been documenting for several years. And McCain, he's over there. He's, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies and hanging out with known terrorists. And then he wants to come back to the state side and criticize Rand Paul for not knowing who these people are. Yes, uh, Senator McCain, I'm sure you do know who these people are. You've been arming them and funding them and wanting uh, more aid to go to them. Meanwhile, they're doing all these atrocities, including uh, chopping off a little boy's head. And that's just what happened here recently. You can go back to the archives, whether it's here or someplace else, and see the numerous crimes these guys have done, whether it's burning down Christian villages or shooting priests or you know any number of things going on for a very long time, but it's just now making the news. But when it does make the news cycle, CNN is just going to say it's a mistake. It was a, uh, one, one last time, it was a, quote, individual error, according to CNN, that this little boy lost his head. Now, let's move on to some other news and lighten up the mood here a little bit. Let's talk about the Republican National Convention and the things that are going on out there. Now, if you haven't seen the video, there's been a whole lot of stuff going on, a lot of big interviews, the guys that they had a chance to talk to, Dinesh D'Souza and Nigel Farage and uh, many other celebrities out there as well. Ted Nugent was on the show today. Alex had a bit of a scuffle out there yesterday, but we're talking about something a little bit different, and this is Breitbart. Uh, they're talking about The Daily Show. Now, personally, I have never seen a full episode of The Daily Show. I, I can honestly say that. I've seen snippets of it here and there, um, you know, when they, when they make it around the news cycle, hey, watch this funny clip of The Daily Show. I may watch some of that. I've never seen a full episode, whether with, with the new guy or with Jon Stewart. So I don't know how they edit their videos. Many people are saying that they selectively edit them. I don't know. But here's a clip where this is the Breitbart News editor, uh, Joe Pollack. He had a chat with The Daily Show about their editing process. What I think you're doing is I think you're ambushing people who and came to our and party. I know, and I'm saying right? you're totally welcome right? to stay That's what I think you're, you're doing. have that opinion. I can film you ambushing people. I'm totally entitled to do that. You're here By the way, for our event. Ambush yeah, absolutely. Sir, we're right. completely right. honest with where we're from and, right? and what we're doing. But you're not honest with the people you interview, are you? Yes. You splice and dice. This has been said many times, we and I've edit, seen it happen. Like, every you single edit. television show. You, you edit. You edit to make people. You edit to make people look stupid. This is not the argument. It's not. It's not your responsibility. And that was the reaction because uh, I run into people sometimes, and if I if I have a street interview with somebody, I usually prefer to record it. Whether I just have an iPhone in my pocket, or you know, I've gone on the street with Biggs when he's talked to other news agencies, and we always record it just in case. For whatever reason, there's some creative edit later on. We have the account of what actually happened, and they were doing a similar thing here. Uh, you can argue whether they'd be in a brace of a nod either side, but uh, that's what that situation was. Now, let's talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is the Second Amendment here in the United States of America, and that is the right to bear arms. And an arm is not restricted to a firearm. That's what a lot of people assume it is. Or they try to water it down. You have to understand back at the time that the Second Amendment was written, everybody's like, it's about muskets. Arm is an arm, whether it was a bow and arrow at the time or a crossbow or a sword or whatever else. And that continues with the weapons here today. And now we see that the Massachusetts Attorney General is moving to ban sales of copyright assault weapons. And this is Attorney General Healy. Healy announced that her office was ratcheting up enforcement of the state's assault weapon ban by targeting guns whose actions are similar to AR-15s and AK-47s, but meet current cosmetic requirements such as being sold without features like a flash suppressor, bayonet lug, or telescoping stock. Now let's take a second right here and pause. Do any of these provisions that I just mentioned, whether it's a flash suppressor, bayonet lug, or telescoping stock, uh, that doesn't really make the gun shoot any faster because that's what the 
the notion is, I guess, in the assault weapons ban, you don't want a fully automatic rifle. Uh, having a bayonet lug, when's the last time you've heard a story here in the United States of America of somebody being stabbed with a bayonet that's affixed to the end of an AK-47 or AR-15? I, I don't know of uh, one off the top of my head. Also, the stock, all that is is it moves the the butt of the gun back and forth. So let's say if you have longer arms, you can extend it out. It doesn't make your gun shoot any faster so they're banning truly cosmetic features of your of your gun it's like if you're having spinning rims on your car the, the spinning rims don't make the car go any faster it just makes it look different uh, but we'll go down here to the quote of healy and she said this will end now and this is an editorial piece for the boston globe on wednesday we are sending a directive to all gun manufacturers and dealers that makes clear that the sale of these copycat assault weapons is illegal in massachusetts with this directive we will ensure that we get full protection intended when lawmakers enact our assault weapons ban. Assault weapons ban. Nobody's trying to take your guns. Nobody wants your guns. Nobody's trying to take your assault. What can you guys put? The, I want everybody to just zoom in on that. Make sure everybody gets that. This is a quote. Assault weapons ban. Her words, not mine. And not the watered down version of these protections offered by the gun manufacturer. So this is Attorney General Healy. Massachusetts saying she wants an assault weapons ban. Well, number one, there is an assault weapons ban currently ongoing in the United States of America. You cannot go Joe Blow off the street, walk into Academy Sports and Outdoors or Cabela's and buy a fully automatic gun. You can't do that. If you do do that, you have to have a class three license. And if you think just do going through the background check, this is a background check of a background check of a background check. It takes you like six months to get what you want anyway. Uh, so these are the things that they're doing and as I said, they're banning guns on cosmetic features, just like in New York, the New York Safe Act, similar things. They're talking about the, the stock on your gun. Things that have nothing to do with your gun shooting faster or slower. It's just a cosmetic uh, entity to the gun. Nothing to do with uh, fully automatic or anything else at all. They just ban things because they don't like them, because they don't like the style. You know, you can get a, a 22 AK-47, or it's just pretty much the AK-47 frame with a little 22 bullet, which is a plinker, just something people use for target practice, and people want to ban those because of the way that it looks. That's truly what's going on here. Now let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Matt Drudge and the uh, alternative media in general. Because over the past few years, or I guess decade or so, Drudge has been a huge news, news aggregate, pushing a lot of good information out there, but now they're attacking Drudge, and they're doing everything they can to pull down Donald Trump. And if they had to pull down Matt Drudge to do that, they will do that. And we see desperate liberals blame Drudge for Trump's rise. In a recent Business Insider article, link aggregator DrudgeReport.com is accused of aiding the businessman's rise to power by rewarding conservative media publications who cover Trump in a positive light with website traffic. Now let's stop right there. Are there pro-Trump websites? Yes. Are there pro-Hillary websites? Yes, I'll name some. CBS, uh, CNN, MSNBC. Those are what you would call pro-Hillary websites, or at least a pro-democratic website. So to go after Drudge for doing this, but to turn a blind eye to these other news organizations is highly hypocritical. Tossing Trump's considerable mastery of the press aside, Drudge is painted as a kingmaker who used his agenda setting power to move Trump to the top of the ticket. Once again, uh, when you have CBS, you have CNN, you have MSNBC doing all these pro-Hillary pieces, which I mean, at the end of the day, they do have the freedom of speech to do that. But then to attack Drudge for putting things out there about Trump, I, I don't really understand the logic in doing that. It, and as far as I'm concerned, I think Drudge, if Trump does something good, he says Trump did something good. Trump does something bad. He did something bad, just like with the Mike Pence situation. A lot of people on the fence with that. And he didn't bury the fact that he picked Mike Pence. He put it right up there at the top of the of the Drudge report with a big red link saying Mike Pence is a pick. And many people had many negative things to say about that, not about of the article about Drudge, but just the fact that he picked Mike Pence. So I think that's a very uh, a silly way to view Matt Drudge. Now let's talk about another journalist, and this is a prominent journalist that was killed in an apparent car bomb assassination, and this was in Kiev. The country's top online news website said its journalist died in an explosion early on Wednesday as he got into his car to drive to work to anchor a talk show on a local radio station. The publication said the car was owned by its editor-in-chief. Now, when it comes to journalists, you know, I'm 
very sensitive when people you know die in these type of situations because even if I don't agree with somebody's politics, it could be somebody who's like my bizarro. They're you know they're anti-gun, they're pro-abortion, and on and on and on. If that person truly believes in what they're doing, regardless if I agree with them, I don't want to see harm come to them because at the end of the day, they're doing what they think is right just like I'm doing what I think is right. So I can respect that even if I don't agree with that. And the same thing when I seen uh, just a couple years ago, the guy, Reporters Without Borders, got killed and people were throwing mud on him like, oh, he deserved it. I'm like, no, the guy was doing what he thought was right and I can respect that. So it's very sad to see this, this type of harm come to journalists, especially in this you know free and open society, supposedly. And we'll end with this. Uh, I saw an op-ed piece today. I think it was on Drudge Report or Drudge linked to it. It was an LA Times piece saying that the government or the military was basically going to have to revolt against Trump if he gets elected. And, and it goes to all this uh, scenario and could happen, sensationalism, all that. And that's one way to look at it. But we also have a Benghazi survivor saying that special operators will leave the military if Clinton gets elected. So you can pick your poison. You want Trump, you want Hillary. I personally don't want either of them, but you're welcome to your opinion. We'll be back right after this break with more special reports. Are we at risk of losing some of our special operators, some of our best guys? You already are. Really? There's guys leaving now just because of that, because they don't know if the call for help is going to be heard. This council has no hesitation in proclaiming you all guilty. 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 Or, or, or not, uh... <laughs> you will not down before me, Jarrell!
saved the flag right there.
Ashley Beckford here with Infowars.com. I'm on the University of Texas campus at the Barbara Jordan statue to talk about liberty, to talk about America, and to ask people what they think about Mila Yiannopoulos's uh, Twitter account being suspended permanently. So, are you familiar with who Milo Yiannopoulos is? Uh, yes, I know. Yes. Okay, did you hear that he was permanently banned off Twitter last night? Yes, I did. Okay, and so how do you feel about that? That's what I'm trying to find out. Uh, well, I don't know all the facts of the story, but what I heard that is that um, he was saying some insulting things. To yeah, him. Leslie Jones, it's yes. a comedian who's in the Ghostbusters film. He said some insulting things and they got his Twitter followers to, you know, band together and start insulting her. Mm -hmm. And so um, she talked to the CEO of Twitter, permanently banned. What do you think? Well, I mean, I like free speech, but I also think that Twitter is a private company and they have the right to do whatever they want. Like, so if they ban Milo Yiannopoulos, and even though, like, you know, I like free speech and I, I think that he has a right to say things, but I don't think that Twitter is, like, should be forced to keep everyone on site that, you know, like, that can say whatever they want. Do you think Milo should actually be, uh, you know, banned because he got people to, like, complain about her movie? Because he's now been permanently suspended off Twitter. What do you think? I mean, I think that was a good measure. And since he's a public figure, he should also apologize because he's, like, he's encouraging bullying and he has a position of power. So, I mean, that's not cool. <laughs> well, what about, uh, you know, free speech to say, hey, I don't like your movie. Hey, I don't think you're a funny comedian. You know, you, that should be banned. What about people who are ISIS sim sympathizers or people who are with Black Lives Matter who say, like, I just showed you kill the cops. They're they're mm -hmm. You know, is it because he's uh, famous and he has a larger reach? You think? I mean, I think free speech in general doesn't mean you can say what you want without consequence. Like, you have the right to, like, yell fire in a movie theater, but there's consequences for that because you're going to start a riot. To me, that doesn't sound like a free speech issue as much as him violating some terms and conditions that are inherent in, him, like, his contract with Twitter. Because yeah. I don't think you're allowed to, like, give someone's private information and then direct thousands of any type of messages their way that are unsolicited. Well, yeah, it, it wasn't her private information. It was just her public Twitter account. Uh, I definitely think that... Uh, when you're getting someone to be like attacked like that on Twitter, um, that's bullying. I definitely can relate to cyberbullying in that sense. Uh, I don't think there's any room for that. When it comes to free speech, honestly, I feel like there are a lot of people who don't really, they want to tout free speech, free speech, but they also do not like to think about the repercussions that come along with it. So, yeah. I mean, you're free to do whatever it is that you want, but at the same time, you need to also be you just need to expect consequences too, especially if you're going to be touting out really negative things. Right. So, I mean, if Twitter wants to ban people like that, especially if you're inciting really hateful language and hateful ideology, I feel like, hey, if that's up to Twitter, they can definitely do it. You think people, ISIS people and Black Lives Matter, if they're like saying violent things, they should be banned versus somebody who just said, oh, I don't like your movie? Yeah, honestly, like the Black Lives Matter, I mean, I get how people, you know, are hurt from people, you know, killing other black folks. And, um, you know, I think, you know, it's not only, well, this when they say Black Lives Matter, it's not like they mean only black people matter, you know, like, mm -hmm. they mean like, oh, there's a lot going on that, you know, it's not fair for some, some cop to like come and like, you know, just the way, just by the way you look, you know, yeah. judge you by it. Well, I understand that part, but they're saying like, put them pigs in a blanket. They're saying, these are actual screenshots from Twitter. Yeah. They're saying like, don't feel bad for those pigs. They wanted a race war, now they got one. They killed six pigs in Dallas, ah, ha, ha, ha. So I'm just wondering like, uh, do you, yeah, yeah, right. Just mad, just mad. Like, just mad. Yeah, yeah. He pretty much incited all of his followers to go and completely attack Leslie Jones. And I mean, I thought it was just absolutely disgusting. I mean, again, yes, free speech, but he was participating in active bullying and he was rallying other people to just harass her. So harassment, mm -mm. I feel like there's no room for that. And I feel like Twitter was definitely right for doing what they did. It's fitting that I'm here on the University of Texas campus in front of the Cesar Chavez statue, because he said that you can't oppress those who aren't afraid anymore. Everyone out here pretty much has been saying that Milo Yiannopoulos should be banned from Twitter for uh, insulting Leslie Jones, the Ghostbuster actress, and getting his Twitter followers to come after her. 
Uh, regardless of what you think, I believe it's a attack on free speech. We have leftists who are continuously trying to stop us from being able to express even the most simple opinions, and they're using bullying as a way to break down the Bill of Rights one by one, and it's starting with the First Amendment. And as a journalist, we know that the First Amendment is the most important one. There's a reason why it's the first one. And Twitter is a place where people can actually assemble on the Internet and be able to speak freely. What they're doing to Milo Yiannopoulos is what could be done to you tomorrow if you upset someone, if you hurt someone's feelings on the internet. So let's stand up against people trying to block free speech on social media. I'm Ashley Beckford for Infowars.com. Stay tuned for more special reports. Twitter has slapped a lifetime ban on Milo Yiannopoulos for saying that the new Ghostbusters movie sucked and criticizing one of its lead actors, Leslie Jones. According to Twitter, Milo was banned for, quote, inciting or engaging in the targeted abuse or harassment of others. This was parroted by the New York Times, who said that Jones had suffered, quote, racist and sexist remarks rallied and directed by Mr. Yiannopoulos. Time magazine said Milo was, quote, involved in a campaign of racial harassment. TechCrunch said Milo, quote, quote, urged on a hateful mob. BuzzFeed claimed Milo, quote, incited his followers to bombard Jones with racist and demeaning tweets. Yet there's no evidence for this whatsoever. All these media outlets are brazenly lying. This provably never happened. Milo tweeted that Jones was, quote, barely literate. That's it. That's not harassment. It's a statement of fact. And it isn't proof of Milo inciting a targeted campaign of abuse against Jones. There's no proof whatsoever that Milo incited the targeted abuse or harassment of Leslie Jones, who did engage in the incitement of targeted abuse against another Twitter user. Hmm, who could it possibly be? And it was Leslie Jones. She sent out a tweet on Monday inciting her followers to target someone with whom she disagreed. Bitch, I want to tell you about yourself, but I'm gonna let everybody else do it. I'm gonna retweet your hate. Get her! Get her. That's inciting targeted harassment right there. Under Twitter's own rules, Leslie Jones should have her account terminated. She did the precise thing that Milo was wrongly banned for. She openly incited the targeted harassment of another Twitter user, not to mention engaging in routine, casual racism. But Twitter's a private company. It can refuse service to anyone it likes. Oh really? So can Christian bakeries refuse service to gays? Oh no, that's right, they get fined and shut down. But that has nothing to do with it. You're talking about discrimination law. Except that law isn't applied when it comes to Muslim bakeries refusing to bake gay wedding cakes. Just like Twitter's own rules aren't applied to leftists who engage in violent rhetoric or who incite targeted harassment. Do you know how many threats of violence and outright death threats I've personally reported to Twitter only to see nothing happen every time. So while Twitter was wasting its time and resources on censoring a gay conservative who gave a movie a bad review, ISIS supporters were celebrating terrorist attacks. An actual ISIS jihadist was allowed to threaten terror on Twitter for six months. And they did nothing. Over the last two years, Black Lives Matter supporters have called for killing police officers on a daily basis. Those threats intensified after the murder of five cops in Dallas. How did Twitter respond? It gave them their own emoji. So I guess under these new rules, prominent Twitter users with hundreds of thousands of followers are now personally responsible for racist and violent tweets sent by their followers. Does that mean D. Ray McKesson or Sean King will be held personally responsible for the deluge of violent threats and incitements to kill cops tweeted by Black Lives Matter supporters? Does that mean apologists for radical Islam like Glenn Greenwald will be held personally responsible for ISIS propaganda or death threats sent to conservatives by 
Islamists. Is Justin Bieber responsible when his fans cut themselves with the hashtag cut for Bieber? Is Beyonce responsible when her fans go after One Directioners with death threats and rape threats? Of course not. It's preposterous to suggest that a public figure, an entertainment personality, or a prominent journalist is responsible for what other people post on the internet. Does that mean feminists like Anita Sarkeesian, or social justice warriors in general, will be held personally responsible for the mob witch hunts that ruin people's lives and destroy their careers on a regular basis? No, they they won't. After the smoke cleared, it appears one coup leads to another. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan may or may not have been the victim of a coup by a small minority of military leadership this past Friday. The biggest elephant in the room being, had Erdogan been the target, he would have been taken out easily. However, as Michael Snyder of End of the American Dream writes, if you are going to conduct a military coup, the very first thing that should be on your list is to decapitate the current leadership structure. But even though hundreds were killed and approximately 14 1,500 people were injured during the short-lived conflict, not a single high-ranking official was killed or captured, and Reuters reported, at the height of the attempt to overthrow Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan, the rebel pilots of two F-16 fighter jets had Erdogan's plane in their sights, and yet he was able to fly on. The quote, coup, end quote, had begun on Friday, July 15th. Erdogan was on holiday on the coast. Meanwhile, a war zone unfolded in Istanbul and Ankara. That night, soldiers ordered state television to read a statement declaring that the military had seized control. The Telegraph reported the military stated it had seized control to reinstall the constitutional order, democracy, human rights, and freedoms to ensure that the rule of law once again reigns in the country for law and order to be reinstated. But as Turkish newspaper Hurriyet reported, several soldiers have said that they had been told that they would be taking part in a military drill, and that it was only when people began to climb onto the tanks that they realized they were involved in a coup attempt. On Saturday, as the Erdogan coup subsided and another coup against the educational leaders, justice system, and religious leaders of Turkey was ignited, after speaking with Turkish officials, President Obama made a beeline to go play golf. Meanwhile, Obama's ally, Erdogan, proceeded to hunt down one head in particular related to the root of his prospective dictatorship. Fethullah Gulen, an aging Turkish cleric, a major influence on the overall narrative of opposition in Turkey, who now resides in Pennsylvania. Erdogan is now asking President Obama to return Gulen back to Turkey to silence any opposition to Erdogan's forthcoming full-blown dictatorship. The BBC reported, more than 1,500 university deans have also been ordered to resign and the licenses of 21,000 teachers working at private institutions revoked. The Army, Judiciary, Security, and Civil Service have all been targeted following Friday's coup attempt. 6,000 military personnel have been arrested, with more than two dozen generals awaiting trial. Nearly 9,000 police officers have been fired. Close to 3,000 judges have been suspended. Some 1,500 employees of Turkey's finance ministry have been dismissed. 492 have been fired from the Religious Affairs Directorate. Turkey's media regulation body on Tuesday also revoked the licenses of 24 radio and TV channels accused of links to Mr. Gulen. When you pull back the curtain on Erdogan's regime, the clear indication that a growing alliance between Erdogan's administration and ISIS has quietly been germinating. Daniel Pipes of the Washington Times writes, Kurds, academic experts, and the Syrian opposition agree that Turks, estimated to number 3,000, and foreign fighters, especially Saudis, but also a fair number of Westerners, have crossed the Turkish-Syrian border at will, often to join ISIS. What Turkish journalist Gadri Gersel calls a two-way jihadist highway has no bothersome border checks and sometimes involves the active assistance of Turkish intelligence services. In actuality, the Turks offered far more than an easy border crossing. They provided the bulk of ISIS funds, logistics, training, and arms. Turkish residents near the Syrian border tell of Turkish ambulances going to Kurdish ISIS battle zones and then evacuating ISIS casualties to Turkish hospitals. 
Indeed, a sensational photograph has surfaced showing ISIS commander Abu Muhammad in a hospital bed receiving treatment for battle wounds in Hatay State Hospital in April of 2014. One Turkish opposition politician estimates that Turkey has paid $800 million to ISIS for oil shipments. Another politician released information about active duty Turkish soldiers training ISIS members. Critics note that Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan has met three times with someone named Yasin al-Qadi, who has close ties to ISIS and has funded it. Essentially, Turkey, a majority Sunni Muslim country, but still a secular country, home to Turks, Jews, Greeks, and Arabs, is transforming into an ISIS stronghold under the newfound popularity future dictator President Erdogan gained after his, quote, coup, unquote. John Bound for Infowars.com. Yeah, working classes have no nation. And that's true. And I said it to the guy over there, man. I that's, that's the reason. Well, you can disagree. If I you disagree spent, with you. Well, uh, that's fine. If you spent your time, though, instead of protesting, like building your own business and making yourself successful. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. See, fuck that. So you're not missing. You're missing the key point. We're against businesses. Why would we create our own business? Let me, if we're against let me tell you something. Why would about, you work? How are the workers going to control the means of production if they don't want to work? And, cooper and worker cooperations. We have some. Uh, Baltimore just so, opened a worker cooperative. So just like the, a little bit ago. Would the unions of workers come together and make a business for workers to work it's not, at? It's, it's not, not a exactly business, business because there's no surplus wealth going to capital. It would be a business. It's an industry. It's an industry. We have to reinvest in your business to make things happen. In but the see, here's my argument against co-ops because I don't think co-ops is enough. I think, once again, it's all about democratic control and means production. Well, right now it starts with co-ops. Co-ops play a role. I'll give you that, comment. It helps. Okay. If you don't want it, I'll start my Trotsky splinter party right now. <laughs> I'll have to see you, you guys are, don't get that, dude. Are y'all from, uh, no, I'm getting it all. Are y'all from No, I mean, like, you don't, you don't get it. No, oh, yeah, I don't get anything. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's but he doesn't know who Trotsky is. I know who Trotsky is. Okay. Okay. Great. Wow. Yeah. are learning something. Well, it was Maybe they'll actually read Marx this time before they criticize. I just think it's funny that what I mentioned, why don't you go form your own business and work on that instead of just... Holding out, uh, holding signs. Dude, no, no, no. Here, once again, let's talk like the other question we were talking about in terms okay. of the working classes, man. Like, yeah. once again, the, yeah, the working classes are where it's all about, right? We have more in common with a working class person from another country than I do with any capitalist from here. Or fascist, like some of these other fucking people. You should go talk to them, Mr. Eugenics down there. And who do you consider? Well, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, there you go. Or not. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm against eugenics. Okay, cool. Yeah, are you guys, are you guys no, I would say, I would say. You're, you're info wars. I highly doubt that. Really? No, we made a whole film lie. about I'll, eugenics. I'll words. About they're eugenics. crazy, yeah, I guess but they're not eugenics crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, where'd you get that shirt from? Huh? Oh, my union. Did you buy it? No, a no, union. It was union it. labor. Our oh, union made it. made it. They grew. They grew the. Our union and workers made it, and then no, they built they it. Printed it. And we got it from union. So where did they labor. Buy we got it. We got it. Like all union. It was all union. Right? From way up. All union. All union. You go to our website union and check it out. Yeah. yeah. Union cotton fields. Everything. Union. You organized workers, and we did. We organized workers at uh, um, Sakuma Farms. We stood in solidarity with them. We said, no one's buying berries unless the farm workers, the ones who pick the berries, get their just desserts. We're and we did. We. Huh? We're still on an active campaign against Trisky. They're talking about, they're talking about uh, uh, organizing with them. So, All right. Yeah. Well, we're going to agree to disagree. I'll put my hand out to shake it if you want. Uh, we're not making no, middle see? Yeah, no middle You're not going to fall for that? No, no not going to okay. fall for that. Biological fallacy. All right. All right. All right. We know this is what we're up against, people. All right. People, yeah. People. People that don't want to work, don't want to do I anything. Actually, they that's right. Oh, no, you I do want to work. I'm a carpenter. I do work. Oh, you do work? Yes, oh, I build yeah. these fucking buildings. Yeah, okay. And what do you do with that money? You, you buy things with it, right? That's, no, that's, a, that's what makes the world go round. It's always has well, yeah, to yeah. So let's pay them shit wages so they can't buy any of our shit. Yeah. Capitals will collapse yeah. on itself. Work for it's yourself. <laughs> work for yourself. That's what it's all about. Actually, I kind of do work for myself. So. Yeah, because yeah. because by not having a capitalist. yeah exactly no, no I'm not. I work yeah, for you myself. Are. You work for yourself. <laughs> You're a capitalist. They own their own labor. We're talking about everyone doing that. I own my own that. labor. Uh, I do my own work. I will make my own. Own your own tools. Use capital to buy your tools yeah. and your truck and everything no, else. No, that's not capital, dude. That's money. I, I still have to money. use money because I'm in the capital system. It doesn't mean I agree with using the money. So you're saying, say, hey, I still have to in, like, if you want to be a communist, you have to go live in the woods here, gotta, and you can't use iPhones, you can't use anything else. And you, and you can't pay for Rage Against the Machine tickets, you know, because... 
What do you think those guys are? You think those hey, guys hey, are capitalists? Next time we'll take back the, the five hour work week we Actually, for. Tom Morello. You guys can't have that. Tom Morello is in our <laughs> union, so I don't really have to pay for two <laughs> We get free shirts, right? We yeah. Free stuff, the best kind of stuff. That's the only thing socialists want, it's just free stuff. Free, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you for free stuff, or do you think you have to work for it? I think that all labor is entitled to the goods that they produce. There you go. That's it. Teach according to their ability, teach according to each according to their means. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll end it at there. All right. We'll end it there. I like we attracted a small crowd. Lively debate. All right. All right, you guys have a good one. Later. Rob D. Reporting for Infowars.com. And that's it for our show tonight. We do encourage you to go to PrisonPlanet.tv and get yourself a free trial. You get the nightly news, the special reports, the rants. All right there on PrisonPlanet.tv. Now, if you're trying to keep up with the RNC and you see all the videos and you can't keep track, go to PrisonPlanet.tv where you can get all the footage right there for you. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.